Hey Providence family, it's your student pastor, Pastor Nathan. Welcome you to our online service. We are so happy that you and your family have decided to join us. Hey, first of all, we love you guys. We miss you guys. Um, but we're happy that you're here with us to worship along with us. Um, we pray that your families are doing well, uh, that you're taking care of each other. Um, students, we absolutely miss you. We cannot wait to get back um, to regular services. And we hope that you're doing really well with everything that's going on. Uh, if you need us for anything at all, please feel free to contact us for anything whatsoever. Uh, but other than that, guys, let's get ready to worship. God bless. Exodus 34, 6 says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faith.
connect with one another, but then also study the life of Christ in a very meaningful way. The first thing that I want to give to you or share with you is easternow.com. If you go on your phone uh, and you can download the app easternow.com, you can literally follow the ministry and the life of Christ up to the minute, just about an hour, and just look at his life. I really think it'll be meaningful to us. So if you want to download that at easternow.com, uh, get that and just walk with Christ the last week of his life. Uh, I think you're really going to find that to be enjoyable. So let me just encourage you uh, with that. Hey, the other thing that I want to encourage you to do is connect with us on Easter. And here is one of the ways you can connect with us on Easter. You know, right now we're not meeting, but wouldn't it be cool if next Sunday on Easter Sunday, and then the Sundays after that, if we could just see your face and see what God is doing during this time. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to take your phone out, and I'm going to ask you to hit camera, go to video, and then once you go to video, make sure that it's on your face. It means you might have to kind of rotate uh, the, uh, the picture just a little bit. And then what I want you to do is I want you just to speak a message into the video and then send it to join us at pbccalabusa.com. That way we can watch your message. I'm going to do one real quick. And here's what I want you to answer. What is God teaching you this Easter? What is God teaching you during this, during this time? So... 30 seconds or less, real quick. Now, I'm just going to take mine, show you kind of what to do, and then uh, you, you do the same. And you might just want to say, Happy Easter, Providence Baptist Church, whatever. There's a way to connect. So here we go. Here's what I'm going to do. So, uh, One of the things that God is teaching me this Easter is that in the middle of all of the uncertainty around us, that the one thing that is certain in all of this is that Jesus Christ is still Lord and He is ruling and reigning. Happy Easter, Providence Baptist Church. 20 seconds. All right, so can you do that? Just go to your phone, just send a clip, because we want to see your face uh, next Sunday, and we would just uh, love for you to do that. So that's a way that we can just continue uh, to connect. Uh, something else that um, I want to encourage you to do in just a moment, I'm going to read the Scripture. And there are many of you that are gathered around right now in your family, your kids, your grandkids. And one of the ways that we can make this a more meaningful time is to just... Stop and maybe share what the Lord is doing in the Scriptures. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. All right, so if you're watching this, in just a moment, I'm going to read the passage. We're marching through the Gospel of Luke. We're here in Luke chapter 23. Maybe just when I get through reading the Scriptures, this will be easy for you just to hit pause. Hit pause. And maybe spend just a few moments with the kids, the grandkids, whoever is there in your family, just to say... What is God saying to us in this scripture? How is God speaking? So that may be something that you want to do as a family. So let's get right into the scripture. This morning, I'm going to be preaching on the subject, Jesus died, as we continue our study through the Gospel of Luke. We're going to pick up our reading in Luke chapter 23, verse number uh, 44. Luke chapter 23, verse 44. Here's what the Word of God declares. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, when the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Your hands I commit My spirit. And having said this, He breathed His last so when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man, he had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. And this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of a rock, 
For no one had ever been lame before. The day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. You know, I was watching an interview uh, just the other day with Tim Tebow. And he was actually talking about a book that came out in 2016. The title of the book was Shaken. And the interviewer was asking him, uh, just how did you come up with the title Shaken? I mean, you would think with your life, perhaps the better title would be Unshaken. And he said, no. He said, here's what I've learned in the journey. He said, one of the things that I have learned in the journey is this. Most people cannot identify with winning a national championship. Most people cannot identify with winning a Heisman Trophy. But I've lived through some things that virtually every person can identify with. Most people know what it's like to be rejected. Most people know what it's like to be cut from a team. Most people know what it's like to be shaken. I want you to know that as we study this pivotal passage in Luke chapter 23, it is a passage that, let me just assure you, it shook hell. It shook heaven. And literally, it shook the earth. It is the ultimate passage of rejection. In fact, here's what Jesus cried out from the cross in Matthew 27, 46. Listen to what God says through His Son Christ. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about that for a moment. What was the greatest act of torture on Good Friday? I want you to understand that for Jesus, it was not the beating. For Christ, it was not the scourging. For Christ, the greatest torture on Good Friday was this. He sensed in his heart that his Father had forsaken him. It was the day that Jesus died. Now throughout history, we've done everything we can to try to diminish the death of Christ. We want to just skip over to the resurrection. But what I want you to understand is that the death of Christ is pivotal. Understanding the death of Christ is essential in our walk with God. Throughout the years, there's been a lot of theories trying to discredit the death of Christ. Now, here's two of them. Here's what some people taught in the day of Christ and then it really developed over the last 2,000 years. Still, some people believe this is called the swoon theory. Here's what they believe. They believe Jesus never died. Instead, Jesus slipped into a coma. They placed him in a tomb. Jesus woke up, he went, and he rolled the stone away. He got past the two soldiers, and Jesus never really died. That's the swoon theory. Here's another one. Some people adhere to what they call a kidnap theory. That is, Jesus never really died. He never really even made it to the tomb. That Joseph of Arimathea stole his body. Or his disciples came and worked along with Joseph and took his body. And so therefore, Jesus never really died. But listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is a pivotal passage. It says this. Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, in the midst of all of these speculations, did Jesus die, said this. For I deliver to you, first of all, this means this is the most important thing that Paul has to say to them, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. That means Jesus literally and physically died according to the Scriptures and that He was buried. Here's what we're going to celebrate next week. And that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus had to die to be buried to rise again. So why is this such a big deal? One commentator said these three hours of darkness was a miracle. Where is the miracle in God in human flesh dying? What is the miracle? Well, the miracle is this. In His death, God 
is teaching us about the mission of God. Now let me give you three things concerning the mission of God and His death. Number one, when we look at His death upon the cross, we realize that Jesus' death gives us access to God through Christ. He gives us access to God through Christ. The Bible says this, it is now about the sixth hour. And so here's what's happening. It is now around 12 o'clock. These three hours obviously would extend till about 3 o'clock. It's called the three hours of darkness. It was about six hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sun, verse 45, was darkened, and the veil of the temple torn in two. Two miracles take place here. First of all, the first miracle is that it's dark. It's not only dark at 12 in the afternoon. But the Bible says the earth was dark from 12 to 3. Some have speculated and said the reason the, the earth was dark was because Satan at that moment in time had won. And of course, wherever Satan is, there's darkness. And so Satan in his victory covered the earth with darkness to announce he had won. Others say that it was God turning His back on His Son. God the Father turned His back on His Son and therefore because God was absent during this pivotal time in history, everything was dark. I want you to understand that Satan did not win and God the Father did not leave the scene. But instead, God the Father permeated that place with darkness as once again a vivid reminder of sin. A vivid reminder of the cost of His Son Jesus Christ being nailed to a cross for the sins of the world to demonstrate this incredibly dark time. Understand, God was not absent. He was present. And can I just say this to you, wherever you're watching? God is never absent. God is never absent. God is omnipresent. He's always there. Even in the darkest of times, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit were right there with the Son. Then there's another miracle. The Bible says the temple veil was torn in two. You read that and you think, man, is that really a big deal? Man, is it a big deal? Man, this is a huge deal in the Old Testament. God told the children of Israel to erect a tabernacle. And He gave them the exact dimensions. Go read the book of Exodus. And He gave them the dimensions of the tabernacle. And in this tabernacle, there was a place called the Holy of Holies. And that place, which uh, contained the mercy seat, Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, the Bible says that there was a veil that separated the two. Now there's something really interesting that takes place in the Word of God. It's not found here in the Gospel of Luke, but it's found in the Gospel of Matthew. And here's what Matthew records. Matthew records in Matthew 27 that not only was the temple veil torn, but the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. Now why? Why is this so important? God is teaching us something in the veil. Here it is. God brought salvation to man. God tore it from the top down, reminding us that God has done what we cannot do. Through Christ, through His death, the veil is torn, and now we have access to God. You see, salvation is not from the bottom up, it's from the top down. And so now, the beautiful picture is this, when the veil is torn, the Bible says the earth began to shake. Literally, it was shaking. And the veil is torn. What an incredible thing takes place. God is saying, the veil has been torn. That means that through Christ, through His glorious death, the fact that Jesus actually died, we have access to the God of this 
universe. Man, what an incredible, incredible thing took place when once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom, Yom Kippur, they would go into the Holy of Holies, they would make atonement for the sins of the people. But understand that before they could make an atonement for the sins of the people, the high priest had to make an atonement for their own sin. Why? Because every high priest that ever marched into the Holy of Holies was a sinner just like you and just like me. Over 80 high priests came and went until the great high priest came. His name is Jesus the perfect, sinless Son of God. And this is such a big deal. Not just for us, but for the mission of God. Now why is it? Well, listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 16 and 18. He said this, that He, that's Christ, might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity of for through Him we both, who is both? The Jews and the Gentiles, have access by one Spirit to the Father. And let me tell you something the early church wrestled with. It. Who can be saved? Is it just for the Jews? Is it just for the Gentiles? And here's what the veil being 22 did. It said this. Every tribe, every tongue, and every nation has access to God through the death of Jesus Christ. It's done something more significant, the death of Christ, than any other political movement this world has ever seen. It has bridged the gap that no other political movement has, has, uh, has uh, uh, or the bridge that any other political movement has ever truly done for a long time. It's this, the death of Christ promises access to a king. Listen to this statement without any guard to race or geographic location. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, be not proud of race, face, place, or grace. Why? Because through Christ, we all who have exercised repentance and faith can come to Jesus because of that incredible veil being torn into. You have a great high priest this morning. Let me remind you of this. And the Bible says in Hebrews, he is sympathetic. He has been tempted as we have been. He is the great mediator between God and man. And let me tell you, there's not a problem, there's not a care, there's not a worry that you cannot take to your high priest because he is a sympathetic high priest. And he goes to God on our behalf. Let me ask you a question. How does the temple veil being torn into impact the way you approach Christ, but also the way you think mission? Think about it. If I believe that through His death I have access to God, my prayer life changes. The way I walk with God changes. The way I reach out to people changes. Why? Because I realize that through the death of Christ, through His death and then soon will be His resurrection, we have access to God. I mean, can, can you just stop right now where you're at? And, and can you just in your mind just fathom this? The God that has put breath in your lungs is the God that hears you when you pray. What an awesome thought. We have access to the one and only true God through Christ. Number two, Jesus' death teaches us that it was not permanent. Man, let me tell you something about His death. Jesus died. He physically, literally died. Let me tell you something. This, this death was not permanent. And here's what the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verse 46. Then Jesus, He cried out with a loud voice. A loud voice literally means He yelled it from the cross. Father! Here's what He yells. Father, into Your hands I commit my spirit. Dr. Luke is the only one of the gospel writers that records this statement from the cross. It would be the last of the statements that Jesus would make. You know, I have to be honest with you. I, to the best of my knowledge, I've never prayed that. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But what you need to understand if you're watching this morning is this. This prayer is by no accident. It does two things. Well, first of all, it reminds the people in Jesus' day as He's yelling that from the cross with a loud voice. 
that he is connected with David. If you were to go back in your Bible and read Psalm 31 5, David prayed the same thing. When David prayed the prayer, it was in regards or in context to God saving him from his enemies and from death. But now, the other son of David, Jesus is praying this not for God to deliver him, but rather to be with him in his moment of death. He is proving that he is Messiah from the cross. But there's something else that's incredible about the praise. You may not know this, but every devout Jew that was there around the cross of Jesus on that day could identify with that prayer. You know, there are certain prayers that we can identify with. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. When somebody says that, we've said we've heard that prayer a thousand times. Maybe it's the Lord's Prayer. We've heard that prayer. There, there are prayers that we can identify with. This one, we cannot identify with. But let me tell you, every devout Jew could. Here's why. They called this prayer, a devout Jew called this prayer, a bedtime prayer. So here's what they would do. Every night, a devout Jew would pray this prayer. They'd pray, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now Jesus does something with this prayer that no other Jew had ever done. He adds a word. Did you catch it? The word Father. You see, all of the other Jews saw God as a distant deity, but Jesus on the cross revolutionized this prayer when He uses the word Father. In other words, I have an intimate relationship with the Dad, the Father. Heavenly Father. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It was never supposed to be a prayer of finality. Rather, it was a prayer saying, God, I trust you with my life. Listen to this. Until you wake me up in the morning. Let me say it like this. When Jesus prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Here's what he was saying. Father, I'm going to sleep. I'll see you soon. It was never a prayer that represented permanent death. It was a prayer recognizing and acknowledging the fact that for a person who exercises repentance, turning away from sin, and faith in Christ, we never truly die. In one sense, we live every day with a bedtime kind of prayer. We know that if we lose our lives today, that our last breath here is our first breath in heaven. Father was the sustaining lyric of Jesus' life. One commentator said it. In other words, Jesus was not praying at the cross goodbye. He was praying, Father, I'll see you later. You know, there's a difference in saying goodbye and I'll see you later. There's a difference in giving that final goodbye with the, with the idea that I'll never see that person again and really having that idea instead of I will see you later. Let me tell you something. For the believer, death is not permanent. Physical death, that is. Our last breath here is our first breath in heaven and ultimately will lead to a new breath on this new earth. Man, isn't that good news? I mean, right now, every day we're hearing reports of people dying. Let me tell you something. There's no swoon theory being, being popularized with those that are dying from the coronavirus. They're really dying. They're really taking their dead bodies out. Some of them, what a tragedy being put in refrigerated trucks just to get them out of a hospital. Man, what a, what a scene. And it's a constant reminder that you and I will physically one day die. It's true. So what happens after we die is the question. Well, it all depends. Do you trust Christ or do you trust yourself? Do you trust yourself to get to Him or do you trust what He's already done in coming down to us? I love what Paul wrote to the church in 1 Corinthians 15 because they were wondering, when is Jesus coming? And what happens to those that die before Jesus comes again? Because, you know, the early church thought Jesus was coming in their life. And so here's what Paul gives them in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to what he said. 
He said, Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In this life only, if we have hope in Christ, we are all men to be most pitiful. Here's what he was saying. They've just fallen asleep. They just had a good night prayer. A bedtime prayer. They have fallen asleep. But if you die without Christ, you have no hope. And let me tell you what the death of Jesus teaches me and teaches you. It teaches us that Jesus' death was not permanent. And death does not have to be permanent for you. I'm reminded of the story of a lady who used to show up to, to church potlucks and dinners all the time. And she was somewhat elderly, so the people would come by and they'd bring the food to her. And they would come by, they'd bring her a plate and check on her. And uh, she would say uh, uh, to, the, to the folks as they come by, she'd say, thank you. And, and there, was, uh, there was a guy that would come by and serve her virtually every time they had the meal. And here's what he would say to her. He would say to her, uh, save your fork. Save your fork. And she would say, why? He'd say, because dessert's coming. Save your fork. Dessert is coming. The best is yet to come. She was on her deathbed and her pastor came by. And she was getting ready to say, good night. And the pastor said, is there anything that you want to talk about for your service? She brought him in and said, here's what I want you to do. I want for you in my casket to put a fork in my hand. He looked rather perplexed. said, I've never had anybody ask that day in my life. She said, here's the reason why. All these years I've come to church and I've been reminded, keep your fork the best is yet to come. I want every single person that passes by my casket on that day, when they see that fork, they're going to ask the question, why does she have a fork in her hand? And I want you to tell everybody under the sound of your voice, it is because I believe that in Christ the best is yet to come. My friend, I want you to know that in Christ the best is yet to come. There's a third thing that the death of Christ teaches us. And here it is, number three, Jesus' death changes lives. I mean... Man, I don't know where you're at, but that's just a good place in your living room to say amen. Jesus' death changes life. Now let me tell you, there are three in this story that Jesus changed. There are three groups or individuals. First of all, He changes a Roman centurion, verse 47. The Bible says one of those soldiers looks up and here's what He says. This man is righteous. This man, he surely uh, must be a righteous man. He is the Son of God. The Bible says in verse 47, he glorified God. He turned into a worshiper, the same one that had been around to drive the nails in his wrist and in his feet. Jesus changed his life. You know what's interesting? Fast forward in your Bible. Hit the, hit the fast forward button. Acts chapter 10. We're introduced to a man by the name of Cornelius. You want to know what Cornelius was? He was a centurion. You want to know why Cornelius is such a big deal? Early church, first Gentile convert. Man, what an incredible testimony this Roman centurion had and how the gospel began to spread through, through him and others to other centurions. I'm telling you, Jesus changed the life of this Roman centurion. Let me tell you who else he changed. He changed the life of Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible says Joseph realized that Jesus should have never died. He was a follower of Christ from a distance. He would have been a wealthy man. In fact, he would have been friends with Nicodemus on that same council. Remember the story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He did not consent, verse 51, to their decision. He was from Arimathea, city of the Jews, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Man, with anticipation in his heart, he was waiting for God's kingdom. So the Bible says he's the one that goes to Pilate. He asked for the body of Jesus. He took it down, wrapped it in linen. He laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of a rock that no one had ever been or, or had ever laid there before. Now listen to me carefully. As far as the tomb is concerned, some have said that it's Joseph's tomb that he let Jesus borrow his tomb. I don't believe that's probably the case. You say, why is that? Well, because a man of such wealth would not have had a tomb that close to a place of execution. Many scholars believe that Joseph actually had that tomb ready for Jesus and had had it ready for quite a while. That tomb was earmarked as a place that they would take the Messiah, Jesus, take His body after the crucifixion. Joseph's life was changed forever. There's another group in here. The Bible says there were women that were following Jesus, verse 49. And some of these, in verse 44 through 56, came back and prepared spices 
and fragrant oils. Other gospel writers tell us it wasn't just women, but there were many men. So get this, around the death of Jesus, there were many men and many women whose lives were changed because of the death of Jesus. These changed lives had three things in common. They all watched, they all worked, and they all waited. They all watched Jesus. They all worked for Jesus. They did what they could. And they all waited. Jesus, even in His death, listen to this, in the darkest moment in the ministry of Jesus, those three hours, in His lowest, they prized Him as the greatest. He changed their life. There's a wonderful promise in the Old Testament I'm leave you with. The context here is the nation of Israel, but it's also under the context of a new covenant. And obviously we know the new covenant is found in Jesus. And here is what God spoke to Ezekiel. He said, tell the people this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Here's what he's saying. There's a new covenant coming. Tell the people this. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change their heart. I am going to give them a heart transplant and then at the same time give them a spirit implant. New covenant. Through the death of Christ, Jesus has initiated a new covenant. Remember what Jesus said in the upper room? Drink this cup. It is the what? It's the covenant. When you see the blood, you're going to know that a new covenant has taken place. Man, Jesus changed the Roman centurion. Jesus changed Joseph of Arimathea. And Jesus changed countless men and women's lives all around the cross that day. But can I tell you someone else he's changed? He changed me. In 1996, Jesus radically changed my life. In February of 1996, I repented of my sins and I trusted Jesus and Jesus alone. And can I tell you what He did on that day? He gave me a new heart. He gave me a heart transplant and then gave me a spirit implant. And now, my life has forever been wrecked because of the grace of God. And did you know the same Jesus that changed the Roman centurion, the same Jesus that that changed Joseph, the same Jesus that has changed countless lives, the same Jesus that changed me, and the same Jesus that changed you can change others. Let me give you a statement. Here it is. Did you know that changed lives change lives? Change lives change lives. You know, I don't believe the Great Commission starts in Matthew chapter 28. The Great Commission started in Matthew 27. When the veil was torn from top to bottom, Jesus was declaring with that veil being torn what He declared later in Matthew 28. We're called to go and make disciples. If we have been changed, others should be changed. So I want to ask you a question as we end this morning. Has the death of Christ changed your life? Obviously, obviously, we know the gospel does not stop at the death. It obviously stops, really not even at the resurrection. It stops really all the way through the ascension. And all of these are components of the gospel of Jesus. But if He's changed your life, would it not make sense to say that some people should be changed that are around me because God has changed my life? So over the next week, Passion Week, we call it, I want to ask you to pray. Lord, number one, has the gospel ever changed my life? And then number two, how is the gospel rubbing off on others? Because change lives always change lives. Father, we thank you for your death. We thank you for your resurrection. And God, we thank you that through what you have done on the cross, you have made a way for each person. God, we pray that you would not only change our lives, but change the lives of the people around us. 
All for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have made any kind of decision this morning, or perhaps there's just a prayer request that you have that you want our church to pray for you about, uh, we want you just to look at the next slide, the Connect with Providence Baptist Church slide. Send us an email. Let us know so we can rejoice with you. We can reach out and counsel you uh, because we love you in Jesus' name.